I would like to uh, share with you today uh, from uh, a couple of scriptures, but my theme is very simple, uh, and I will not keep you long uh, if you've got a appointment somewhere else then feel happy that I'm not going to keep you for very long today. But it is a message that we need to have continually uh, reinforced, if that's the right word, to us. Uh, and that is that God is our Savior. And more than this, God is my Savior. So I'm going to emphasize throughout what I'm going to talk about today, that Jesus saves you, that he is your Savior. And I'm going to try and make it as personal as possible. And if you would imagine your name, and you all know your name, hopefully. If you don't, you could be in trouble. And my name is Peter, and Jesus died for Peter. And Jesus died for you. So if you think of your name at the moment, Jesus died for you personally. Gene. Patrick, Norman, he died for you. Now, I would like to put into context a little bit <clears throat> about the fact that Jesus died upon a cross for you and for me. What meaning that has and why that is so very important and I'm going to go back to the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament, uh, many hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Isaiah 43 and verse 11, it says, I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me, there is no Savior. Now, here God was saying very clearly, I am the Lord, beside me there is no Savior. And indeed, if you uh, look at the verse before that, in verse 10, it says, You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant who I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. So God is unique. And God is saying, I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me, there is no Savior. Isaiah 45 and 21 goes on and says, Tell me and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this? From ancient time, who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? There is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to understand that very, very clearly from the Old Testament that God is saying He is the Lord, He is our Savior. And there is no God beside him. There is no Savior be beside him other than him. He is God and he is our Savior. Can you say praise the Lord? <clears throat> now, it's very interesting because in Luke, it says, chapter 2 and verse 11, for unto you, that's to you, everybody said you, and then everybody said me, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, hang on a minute. 
You can't have it both ways. I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. And then here is born in the uh, city of Bethlehem a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. There's something here that if we look into it is very, very important because it tells us quite clearly that God is the only Savior. And it tells us also in 2 Timothy 1 and 10, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and have brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So he is made manifest. He has appeared as our Savior, and now we know his name is Jesus Christ. So this unique individual, Jesus Christ, is our Savior. But if God said, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior, then we need to look at the identity of Jesus Christ a little bit more closely and say, in him, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. When Thomas doubted and said, I will not believe until I can see the nail prints and until I see him for myself, when he finally saw him, when he was told to put his hands into the wounds, he, he did something very extraordinary. He said, my Lord and my God. He worshipped him as God and this tells us the witness of Thomas that here was his God manifest in the flesh to him and here he was acknowledging that Jesus Christ was God. We have from the Old Testament many names, many revelations. Uh, Moses looked and saw the burning bush. Uh, Jesus, uh, sorry, God was known as Yahweh, or uh, as it's transliterated, Jehovah. We know the names of God, and we know uh, the personality and character of God from his attributes, that he is the Lord, our provider. But in Jesus Christ, we see a personal Savior. We see somebody who paid the price for my sin and for your sin. And that is very different to having, I, even I am the Lord, beside me there is no Savior. And you can say, well, that sounds great. But when Jesus went to the cross, he became our personal Savior. He died for you and me. And whether you realize it or not, if nobody, if nobody accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, apart from you, Gene, or Patrick, or Thorla, or Norman, he would have died for you. He died for you personally today. And that is why when we come to God, we come to him, we have a relationship with God that goes beyond. Because we know God is our creator. The average person in the street could tell there's a creator because there is a creation. If people are daft enough not to realize that, then that's up to them. But creation requires a creator. Scientists try to argue that actually you don't need a creator for creation. Now, that to me is just silly. Because creation needs creation by a creator. 
God is and he created in the beginning. Whether you assume that's a big bang or God said, let there be light, that's up to you. But I prefer the biblical version that God created the heavens and the earth and he said, let there be light. Hallelujah. I want you to know that God is my rock. In him will I trust. He is my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, and my savior. And he saves me. Hallelujah. He saves me. Now, if you, if you have a savior, you have to be saved from something. Can you say praise the Lord? If you are on a ship and you, the ship is sinking, you need a savior. You need somebody to save you. If you are in a burning building and you need a, a, a fire person to save you, you need a savior. You cannot help yourself. If you're in a pit like Jeremiah, he couldn't save himself from the pit. Somebody had to take him out of the pit. We were in the pit of sin, and Jesus took us out of the pit. Now, I'm going to uh, prove you to that. Hose, uh, Hosea 13 and 4, it says, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no other God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. In other words, and we know spiritually that Egypt is the land of sin. It was the land of bondage. It was the land where uh, the people were uh, slaves, that they were forced to work under extreme conditions, and they were forbidden to even worship God or spend the time to do that. Uh, they were worked and worked and worked, so they wouldn't have time to do anything else. But if you can imagine your life in sin, imagine the things that have been in your life that have weighed you down in the past, and now you are freed from that bondage. It is like you've got a yoke that's been taken off you. If you've ever seen these weightlifters in the Olympics, I tell you what, I saw one of the Olympic weightlifting competitions on the television, and there was one woman that was lifting something like 145 kilograms. The bar was bending as she lifted it. I couldn't believe it. She was lifting more than my body weight above her head in a what is called a clean and jerk. So she had to hold it for a few seconds above. She lifted that weight. And when all three green lights came on, she dropped it immediately. And the relief on her face was tremendous. When we release the burden of sin, we have a freedom, a release, a relief from everything that has gone before. But to do that, to be saved from sin, <clears throat> we need a savior. And that savior needs to have, as it were, the right credentials. It's no use. Imagine you're in this burning building and Rena goes up the ladder and says, can I help you? And this 300-pound guy said, help me, help me. Take me down the ladder. I can't do it myself. She'll say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't lift you. You're too heavy. That's no good. You can't have somebody who's not qualified, or knows what to do, or has the right credentials to, to say, I can help you, I am your savior in this situation. 
Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. That is why he is the only Savior. Because it goes back to Isaiah. I even, I am the Lord. Beside me there is no Savior. Besides me there is no God. And I have come down to save you from your sin. I want you to put the sin, the weight that does easily beset you and just let it down and have the release and freedom that that comes with. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In times past, we're not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now, it's talking there about people, it's talking about a nation, but it's also talking about individuals. It's talking about me and you. He is my personal savior. If anybody walks back, and does not follow him, if I continue in his goodness and his grace, I will be saved. If you continue in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And you might say, well, surely I have been saved. Yes, you have. Because on the cross, he saves us. Hallelujah. He saved us to the uttermost. He said on the cross, it is finished. It is a complete work. I've shed my blood. I've paid the price for you personally on the cross of Calvary. You are saved. But does that mean we continue in sin? Paul asks. God forbid. We cannot now lift up the weight again and carry it around with us. We cannot carry around the sin because it has been paid for. If we return to that sin, we make ourselves sinners again. And there is no more sacrifice for sin. So we must continue in what God has done for us. He saves us from our sin. More than that, he saves us from our enemies. Amen. You may have a few enemies in, in, in your life. I don't know. Uh, and we are encouraged to love our enemies. But there is spiritual wickedness in high places which fight against us. And we fight not against flesh and blood. We don't allow ourselves to, if you like, fight with violence in the natural sense. We fight with spiritual violence. In other words, we pray and we give to God all of the glory because it was when the people in the Old Testament allowed God to do the work that the victory and the battle was won. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. <clears throat> that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. And I love the scripture that says, and I've quoted it so many times, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So he gives us victory, but he saves us from death. Because we are all, all of us here, if the Lord tarries, going to die one day. But he saves us from death. He gives us the opportunity for eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believeth in him should not perish,
but have everlasting life. You believe in God, believe also in him. Hallelujah. It's talking about God come manifest in the flesh as our personal Lord and Savior. And our lives will be saved for whosoever, in Matthew 16 and 25, whosoever will save his life will lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And then in Acts 4 and 12, <coughs> it gets really exciting. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We are saved in the name of Jesus Christ. He is our Savior, and when we take the name of Jesus Christ in baptism, we are saved. So we are saved on the cross. We are saved as we are baptized. And we are saved if we continue to the end. Hallelujah. There is a process of salvation. We come out of Egypt, as it were, in the Old Testament. We go through the waters of the Red Sea in the Old Testament. We go into the promised land in the Old Testament. Well, I tell you what, we're in the New Testament. Hallelujah. We've come out of sin. We've put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We're baptized in his precious name. And then we will enter into his rest. Hallelujah. The rest of God is the power of the Holy Spirit that rests upon us. Our lives will be saved. And we are saved by faith. In Luke 7 and 45, Jesus was speaking to this man, and he said, Thou gavest me no kiss. This woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And those that were with him said, Who is he that forgives sins? And he said unto the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Our faith saves us. Hallelujah. We are saved by faith. We are saved by the name. We are saved by Jesus Christ. It is all the same. And we are saved in Mark 13 and 13. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Which was and is and is to come. Salvation is a process that continues as we continue in his grace and his mercy. How do we enter? How do we get this great salvation that God has offered? You know, he did the difficult bit. He manifest himself in flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness. We don't even begin to understand how he did that. That's on the technical side for God. It's like uh, Wynne was saying about the math. She doesn't get it. But God did that. And what we have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Because if you believe in God, you believe in Jesus, you repent, you leave your sin behind, you leave that weight Wow, that 160-odd kilograms, whatever it is, you're baptized in his name, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I, even I am the Lord. Beside me, there is no Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I know there are lots of people here that know their God and 
know that he is their personal savior. But if there is anyone who does not know Jesus as their personal savior, has, has not realized that Jesus died for them, then we, we would love to pray. If you want to pray where you are, that's fine. But we want to just give you time to say, God, you're my personal Savior. If you feel you've failed God in some way, you need to repent and come to God afresh and anew and say, God, I want to start afresh today. Whatever is your state, I want you to understand the magnitude of what God did, the extent to which Jesus Christ loves you, died for you, you personally, your personal name is who Jesus died for. Let's all stand. I told you I wouldn't keep you long. Lord Jesus, I pray this morning, this afternoon, for each person that is here today, that, Lord, in their hearts, they would accept you as their personal Savior, personal Lord. Hallelujah. That they would not stray from your will. They would not stray, dear God, into sin, but rather they would embrace your truth would embrace your life. And Lord Jesus, I pray this afternoon that you would be glorified in each of their lives. Each person that is here, let your anointing fall upon them. Each person that is here, let your blessings be upon them. And that, Lord, you would direct their lives and footsteps that they will endure to the end until they are saved into your kingdom when you return. Hallelujah. We look unto that returning where we see our Lord and our God. We shall see him face to face, Jesus. We will see you face to face. Hallelujah. My personal Savior and my God, we worship you in Jesus' name, hallelujah.